Good evening, everybody. We're about to begin. Please uh, silence your electronic devices. And welcome to the stage, DREDF board member Ray Rain Marshall. Hello, everyone. Hello, DREDF family and supporters. My name is Rain Marshall, and I'm a board member. Ha, matakiapi, ima chebi makaju, na pegiwi, chante washte na pe chiuzapi. I introduce myself in my Dakota language. I am Ihangtawan Dakota from Greenwood, South Dakota, and I'm here to honor the first people of this land. I am a guest on this land of the Lasan Ohlone people. The Lasan are made up of the seven nations that were directly enslaved at Mission San Jose in Fremont, California and Mission Flores in San Francisco. Chochenyo Ohlone, Karkin Ohlone, Bay Miwok, Plains Miwok, Delta Yokut, and Napian Potwin. Their territory includes five Bay Area counties, including Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, Napa, and San Joaquin, and they are tied to the Verona Band. I am humbled to be visiting their beautiful homelands, and I want to honor their work in continuing to thrive and exist while protecting their lands and the struggles to get their land back and to steward Mother Earth. If people here today are able, please consider donating to the Segorate Land Trust to help the original people of this area continue to care for the place where their ancestors are buried and where their, tra their sacred traditional knowledge has been passed down for thousands of years. This is a quote from their organization about their vision. Segorate Land Trust cultivates rematriation of the land and calls on all of us to heal and transform the legacies of colonization, genocide, and patriarchy, and to do the work our ancestors and future generations are calling us to do. So with much gratitude, Wopala, thank you. Enjoy the event. Thank you, Rain. Uh, good evening again, everyone. I'm Steve Kay, Chair of the DREDF Board of Directors and Professor Emeritus at the University of California, San Francisco. On behalf of the board, it's my pleasure to welcome you to DREDF's 45th anniversary gala. Whether you're here in the room, whether you're here in the room or participating remotely, thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks especially to our sponsors, many of whom are here in person or online. As we get started, I'd like to introduce a special guest, Latifa Simon, who is about to stand up. <laughs> Latifa is running for Congress to represent Oakland, Berkeley, and other parts of Alameda County in the House of Representatives. And she is very likely to win her election. She told me just after she walked in the door, that she plans to be a champion for disability rights in Congress. Now, I'm supposed to draw your attention to the QR code on the screen, but I don't actually see one. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, if you point your phone to, the, to that code, you'll be taken directly to a web page where you can donate to DREDF uh, during this event. This evening we celebrate the 45th anniversary of DREDF's founding. In 1979, four people working at the Disability Law Resource Center, a project of the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley, decided to spin off their own organization. 
and Dredif was born. Those four founders were Mary Lou Breslin, Bob Funk, Arlene Mayerson, and Pat Wright. Arlene, Arlene retired in 2020, and Mary Lou is still hard at work as Dredif's senior policy advisor. I doubt that those four pioneers could have envisioned that we'd be here all these years later celebrating the organization they started and that's going stronger than ever. With many of us sitting in a huge atrium full of disabled people and our allies with, with a vibrant, universally designed, architecturally significant building that houses an array of important disability advocacy and service organizations. There's one other person I want to celebrate this evening, someone whose contributions to DREDF are on par with those of the founders. Susan Henderson worked tirely on DREDF's behalf for 27 years until she insisted on retiring this past summer. Back in 1997, the lawyers and policy people who were running DREDF apparently decided that they needed somebody with actual business credentials. They hired Susan, who has an MBA, as director of administration first, and then they promoted her to managing director in 2004, and then executive director in 2008. So you could say that she basically ran the organization for 20 years, 20 years of growth, innovation, and organizational stability. Because Susan prefer prefers to work quietly behind the scenes, you might not realize the extent of her contributions to DREDF and to the disability community. Under Susan's leadership, DREDF more than doubled in size from 11 staff members to 25 today. A bigger organization means bigger budget and a lot more money to raise. And over the years, Susan has been the organization's principal fundraiser, writing countless grant proposals, submitting all the reports and paperwork needed to keep those funds coming in, and forging relationships with donors and foundations. Thanks in large part to her efforts over many years, Dredef received one of the first grants from a major foundation focusing on disability rights work. Money that kept us thriving during the COVID pandemic and enabled us to mobilize in response. Grants that Susan brought in enable us to respond nimbly to emerging issues like climate change and the aftermath of the Dobbs decision. Do we have captioning? Do we have captioning? Somebody in the back can tell me whether we're having? OK, there we go. Um, we'll be hearing later about DREDF's essential advocacy on behalf of children and families, a pro program that Susan herself led and expanded to cover much of Northern California. She envisioned and launched DREDF's partnership to improve media representation of disabled people, which we'll also be hearing about. She led DREDF's international programs, supporting local disability groups in several countries over the years. Finally, this building, the Ed Roberts Campus, it's the embodiment of a vision created by Susan and the other founding ERC board members. A $45 million project covering 82,000 square feet, which took 12 years of hard work to bring to fruition. There's nothing else like it. In recognition of these and other accomplishments, the Viscardi Center awarded Susan the Henry Viscardi Achievement Award in 2022. Now, would you please join me in a round of applause for Susan Henderson in recognition of her 27 years of tireless efforts on behalf of DREDF and disabled people. Clearly, the past 12 months have been a year of great change for DREDF. The search for a new executive director was long and difficult. We conducted a rigorous national search, and we ended up choosing somebody from right across the bay. Nicole Bond comes to us with 27 years of experience leading disability organizations. Most recently, she directed the San Francisco Mayor's Office on Disability. In that role, according to advocates, 
she came up with the vision for the San Francisco Disability Cultural Center and led or co-led the effort to make it come to fruition. And now it exists as the only municipally funded disability cultural center in the country, perhaps in the world. As a San Franciscan myself, I'd like to brag about that. While leading the mayor's office on disability, Nicole had a major role in San Francisco's response to COVID, including establishing accessible public meetings and disability-specific vaccine clinics. She's also credited with fixing a broken process for ensuring accessibility of affordable housing. And she created a citywide training initiative on anti-ableist strategies. Prior to that, Nicole worked at San Francisco State University where she ran the Disability Programs and Research Center, and Resource Center, sorry. She worked to make the campus's physical and social environments more accessible to disabled students, staff, and faculty, and oversaw accommodations for vast numbers of students and employees. She has two master's degrees, one in counseling psychology and another in creative writing. And I just found out she's a jazz singer. More importantly, Nicole has a li lifelong commitment to the disability movement. It is now my great pleasure to bring to the stage DREDF's new executive director, Nicole Bond. How are we doing? Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's really a privilege. I'm going to open my notebook here. So, we, isn't it, first of all, I just want to say, isn't it great to be back? We have not been in person with this gala, with this group of people since before COVID. It is fantastic to see you all. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks to, I know so many of you and I want to get to know everyone who I don't know yet. Thanks for being here. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Their names were scrolling earlier. I want to though especially thank the two inaugural sponsors of our inaugural Judy Human Fellowship, Kathy Pugh and Guy Wallace. Thank you so much. And is Felicia here? Are you here, Felicia? If Felicia was here earlier uh, and is with us tonight, our inaugural. Uh, a Judy Human Fellow. Uh, we're so pleased to have them with us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what brought me to DREDF, and you'll be learning a lot tonight about all of the individual uh, work that the staff members do and the important work that we have all been up to. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge two people in particular who have made my first three months go as smoothly as possible. Um, this, I am the executive director, but I want to say that DREDF would not run without our offer operations director, Diana Vega. Diana, if you're here, <laughs> wave, please. And our office coordinator, Hong Yoon Min. Wave, Hong Yoon, thank you. And <clears throat> Hong Yoon, I want to acknowledge that Hong Yu is beginning his 21st year with us, helping run our front line. Thank you so much. So uh, in order to help you understand how I came to DREDF, you first need to know three things. First, I've lived with a lifelong disability. Second, as Steve talked about, my entire professional career 
has been devoted to working with folks with disabilities. And the third thing is I was a very late bloomer in terms of my disability identity. And while I didn't ignore disability exactly, I couldn't, I couldn't ignore it. I live with it and the access barriers, especially as a wheelchair user and especially as a young person, but still now, we're in our everywhere. And I wasn't exactly proud to be disabled. It was hard, especially when you don't see yourself or don't particularly want to see yourself. But even as a young person, I knew there were people fighting for access. My parents certainly did. I think they're watching virtually. Hello, mom and dad. <laughs> and so my parents certainly did, as parent, our parent training advocates do now. And I knew there were people fighting for disability civil rights. As a young and barely 20-something at the University of Wisconsin, I knew about DREDF. In my 20 years working in disability access in the university settings, I referred to DREDF's materials all the time. Somewhere in there too, I came into my identity as a disabled person. And then for eight years, I built relationships, but sometimes convinced and cajoled municipal folks into providing better access. And I can't tell you the number of times I told myself, let's see what DREDF says first. And then I had several occasions to work with uh, DREDF staff, Claudia, who you'll hear from, and Carol as well. And then Susan's retirement annou was announced. And, the, and I, as I thought about this, I came to understand that the truth is that myself and so many deaf and di disabled and neurodivergent people would not be anywhere at all without dread of fight for civil rights. And leading here is truly, truly a privilege. <laughs> One of the best things is in my first three months, I have never once been posed here at DREDF with the question, do we really have to do this? <laughs> or what's the minimum thing that I need to do? The question at DREDF is always, always has been and always will be, how do we make this work? We always prioritize the how over the why, but in order to do the how in, in the way that we want to be able to do it, we need all of you. We need disability community. We need legislators. We need everyone to be working together. And I see part of my job as bridging our deep 45 year history with being on the cutting edge of future access. And in a minute, I'm going to pass the mic to others who will tell you about our current and our emerging work. First though, I wanna make a little announcement I am thrilled to announce that as a marker of our history, uh, DREDF is prominently featured in an upcoming PBS American Experience documentary about the making of the ADA. And they interviewed Mary Lou and Pat and Arlene and Lawrence Carter Long, and this will be a broadcast as part of their 2025 season. So exciting. But they were in our offices recently and they took photos and video. Some of it's displayed here at the back of the table. Um, and really the emphasis being there would be no disability civil rights without DREDF. And we have a unique opportunity now to define exactly who we want to be as a state and national organization. And you'll learn a little bit more in a second about what makes our work distinctive. I'm heading to Washington DC next week to strengthen connections and to continue to build relationships that promote the best possible outcomes for disability access and civil rights. But coming from community, I have always known and I will always know that the only way to do this is to define who we are and continue to work and be in partnership with others, with other community members, with people with and without disabilities, and people interested in being on the cutting edge as DREDF was 45 years ago and is today.
thank you so much for being here and for continuing to support our work. So the next thing I'm going to do is, so here's the other thing that you didn't know. So I get to be your ED and your MC today. <laughs> and so due to multiple extenuating circumstances, you will get to know as our program goes on, we'll be watching quite a number of videos tonight. And so here's the first in our Dread of Gala mini documentary film festival <laughs> the, that you weren't expecting either. Uh, so uh, here's a little uh, video uh, about Dredf. Sylvia, Dredf recognizes the barrier. We bring people together to talk about how to get rid of the barrier. And when push comes to shove, we shove. We shove with all the tools we have. I'm Michelle Uzetta, Senior Counsel at Dredf. We take on cases challenging unlawful housing discrimination so people with disabilities have equal access to safe, accessible, and affordable homes and communities of their choosing. I'm a special education attorney. It's sad to think that in 2023, even now, years after Brown versus Board of Education, disabled students still are not taught how to access the basic building block of life, which is learning how to read. It's my job to get school districts, get states to provide that basic building block to provide them the access to literacy that they need. In California, we've had a lot of work on strengthening and supporting access to reproductive care, including abortion. In some of that work, there isn't necessarily a recognition that for people with disabilities who can become pregnant, there are built-in barriers. There are barriers to getting health care, to getting on the table. There are barriers to making appointments. Finally, we're getting research on how much providers find it difficult to deal with people who use wheelchairs, with people who have developmental disabilities and so forth. You have women and people who are pregnant and in that situation looking for reproductive care. They are facing barriers that are specific to disability, but that aren't necessarily recognized by those who are in the area of reproductive care, reproductive justice, and reproductive rights. A lot of what we do is educating people to recognize barriers. We're about creating a world that doesn't have those barriers, where the default is not having a barrier, rather than a default where the barriers all exist. Sometimes it takes pushing. Sometimes it takes a lot of pushing. And Jedef has been pushing since 1979. Okay, so now you get MC Nicole. And in this role, I am thrilled to introduce Mia Ives Rubley. Mia Ives Rubley is a policy analyst, community organizer, and a passionate advocate. She is director of the Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress. She is one of the commissioners on the President's Advisory Committee on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, leading the effort for better access to disability accommodations and more disability inclusive policy platforms at the 2017 Women's March. Ives Rubley was named by Glamour as one of 2017's Women of the Year awards. She was recognized by She the People as one of the 20 women of color in politics to watch in 2020. She was awarded the 2019 Distinguished Alumni Award from the University of North Carolina School of Social Work. Now, due to barriers that many of us have faced in the disability community with wheelchairs, with durable medical equipment, and providers getting the correct equipment with the correct and appropriate timing, unfortunately, she had planned to be here in person and it did not work out. However, we welcome her live from her home in Greensboro, North Carolina. Welcome, Mia, thank you for being with us. Ooh, 
top notch, Nicole, for that fantastic introduction. And thank you, Greta, for inviting me to speak tonight at the 45th anniversary gala. I am so sorry I was unable to be with you in person. I was really looking forward to being in Oakland, one of the most important places due to its ties to the disability and civil rights movements. I was unable to come due to delays with my DME provider, which I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences in the past. Again, my name is Mia Ives Rubley, and I can proudly say that I am part of the ADA generation. A generation of disabled people who grew up knowing we deserved civil rights, the legal protections enshrined into law. We were the first generation to be able to dream of a future outside of institution. A generation that believed we could live and participate in our communities. We have so much to thank to those who came before us, including Ed Roberts, Benny Lou Hamer, Judy Human, Justin Dart, Congressman Major Owens, and many others who paved the way. I became a civil rights activist due to my own history. I was born in Busan, South Korea with osteogenesis imperfecta and spent my first few years in foster care. This experience taught me early on that we live in an unequal world. At the age of three, I immigrated to the United States through inter-country adoption to a mostly white working class family. My parents instilled in me the belief that I deserve the same future as my non-disabled siblings. And they had the same expectations for me and much to my chagrin, had me do the same chores around the house. My mom was an early intervention specialist and was well-versed in disability education policy. As I grew up, it was my mom who would storm into the administrative offices at school I attended to tell the administrators and teachers that they had violated my rights to an equitable education. I remember one day in middle school being told by my choir teacher that she hadn't gotten an accessible bus for a school trip. I was absolutely devastated. I went to class later that day and watched my classmates who had just returned laughing and talking about the trip. When I got home, I told my mom about the experience and she consoled me like any other caring mother would. The next day, I was surprised to be called into the vice principal's office. and There was my mother looking angrier than a queen hornet stirred from their nest. Both the, vice pres both, both the vice principal and my teacher were forced to apologize to me and told me that the situation would never happen again. And it didn't while I was in middle school. It was my parents' passionate advocacy that laid the groundwork for my own future. When I got to college, I decided to study sociology and social work. I initially attended the University of Illinois due to its wheelchair sports program. However, what I got out of it was more than just wheelchair sports. I got my first introduction into the history of the disability rights movement. I didn't realize that in 1947, the school was the first post-secondary institution to offer an official support service program to disabled students. Due to the lack of coursework on the topic, I researched the disability rights movement outside of my regular coursework and became fascinated with the movement's coalition work with other civil rights movements. I had literally grown up where some of the, mo the first nonviolent sit-ins at World Wars happened. Yet, hadn't known how integral the Black Panthers were 
to helping pass the Rehabilitation Act, providing community care as disabled people took up space and federal buildings for weeks at a time. My studies reinforced my commitment to being of service to my community. So after getting my master's in social work, I applied to over a hundred jobs and was finally employed by the Vocational Rehabilitation Services in North Carolina. There, I began to understand how ingrained happy policy decisions impacted the lives, our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. For six years, I spoke with disabled people looking for ways to help keep their heads above water. They juggled the time suck of administrative burdens like multiple interviews and evaluations from social benefits like SSI and SNAP while also trying to look for an employer who wouldn't discriminate against them for their disability. One day, I would work to ensure an individual got business closed so that someone would interview them for a job. A few weeks later, I would be scrambling to get their Medicaid reactivated because they had lost the benefits due to not getting time off for a Medicaid review. It's quite obvious to me that much of our work was putting band-aids on a broken system. I absolutely believe poverty is a policy choice. It is a choice to make it difficult to live on SSI and SSDI. It is a choice not to make housing accessible and affordable. It is a choice to scam folks out of their federal aid and loans to line the pockets of for-profit schools that prior to prioritize profits over students. It is a choice to pay disabled people sub-minimum wages. Those in power have chosen to leave behind huge portions of the population in order to continue to hoard wealth and power. The over-surveillance, marginalization, and criminalization of communities like mine has resulted in too many of my community left tortured and dying in prisons and nursing homes. We have been told for far too long to be patient and to wait our turn. But justice delayed is justice denied, particularly impacting the most marginalized in our community. And as Fanny Lou Hamer said, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. We have come so far in terms of gaining equity in this country, and yet we have so far left to go. I went into policy work because I believe that we need more people who have lived experiences providing policy advice to those who write our laws. We need people from the margins who can combine qualitative and quantitative analysis and see how the patchwork of US federal and state laws impact some of the most marginalized in our communities. As I've worked in policy and politics for the past four years, I've been able to utilize my experience and work of others to evaluate from a disability lens. Everything from immigration to reproductive health care to policing policies. Policy is like a 3D puzzle. And it's essential we take every piece into account, or else the whole puzzle will fall apart. What makes me hopeful in this work is seeing the amazing work of folks like Stacey Park Milbroom. Patty Byrne, Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, Tail Lewis, Lydia X. Z. Brown, and many others who have carved new avenues of work, including establishing a disability justice movement founded on community care. We also now have outwardly open disabled people at the heads of disability advocacy organizations, 
federal and state agency leaders and elected officials. With all of this progress, we have the opportunity to forge our own future. So what does the future entail? It must include and highlight from the most marginalized community members. Because when we ensure their inclusion, we improve life for everyone. That means getting out of our silos and building stronger coalitions. It means enacting disability justice principles, particularly around cross disability solidarity and cross community solidarity. No one should be left behind. It also means jacking up sidewalks to create curb cuts because sometimes you just have to grab a sledgehammer, sledgehammer and get the job done. We may make mistakes along the way, and believe me, we have made mistakes. But we should utilize transformative justice to remain accountable as we continue our path forward. I am so thankful to organizations like DREDF who are on the front lines pushing policies forward that help disabled people access services so that we can live and thrive in our communities. So, if you remember anything from my speech tonight, remember this. People create policy, and we can work to ensure that policy represents all of us, from our homes, to our sidewalks, to our schools, to our country. We can push for better. So please, stay involved in organizations like DREDF and get involved in your communities. And if you can, participate in our democracy. Thanks again for having me. Next up, please enjoy this video from Jim LeBrecht. Hi, everybody. I'm to be there in person. Um, my COVID is a reminder to mask up and do it for yourself and for others. Uh, it's so important. It really is about access and love for other people, and especially in our community. I was asked to tell you a little bit about my being on the board for DREDF. I was on for a very long period of time, and I remember when I was first asked if I would join, I, I literally felt like, oh my gosh, I've just got a call from the White House, and they want me to join the administration. This is how much I've always held dread of and just uh, in my heart, knowing our history and how important this organization is. And I was so happy to be involved with so many different people uh, on the board, the work we were doing, um, and especially being able to spend time with our dear friend Judy Human in, in that capacity getting to know Steve, other folks on the board, really enriched my life. Finally, I found out that uh, you folks are about to see the trailer for a new documentary called Patrice the Movie. I'm an executive producer on this film. I just came back from two film festivals, the Toronto International Film Festival, where uh, Patrice had its world premiere, and then on to Camden, Maine, to the Camden International Film Festival, which is a highly regarded and beloved documentary film festival. Um, the reception in Toronto was wonderful. We had two screenings. People uh, were coming up to us, and uh, everybody fell in love with Patrice and Gary and Elizabeth, the people you'll meet in this film. In Camden, Maine, we had a packed house. The audience was so engaged. They loved this story. And we wound up winning the Audience Award for Documentary. I know that this film is incredibly impactful. The, the, everybody that worked on this film um, um, are just incredible people. And this story is really, I really believe is gonna push the needle. I think that we needed a film like this 
for people to refer to, to really discuss the impact of what the marriage penalty means on so many different people's lives. Um, it's going to be available on Hulu on September 30th. I really encourage you to watch it. Watch it twice. Spread the word. And let's build a grand swell that is loud and undeniable so we can get the kind of legislation passed that will eliminate this horrible policy. Without much ado, here's the trailer for Patrice. Hi, my name is Patrice. I am a totally cool person with a disability who could do most anything. Hulu Originals logo. Patrice always sees the best side of life. Official selection, Toronto Patrice Film Festival. A big magnet for people. If it can be done, she will do it. Text reads, she can make dreams come true. Gary, he's everything. He just looked at her and I said, would you like to be my wife? Text reads, except one. You get married and you're collecting a social security benefit, your benefit will be cut. We have to have it. We'd never be able to pay for the bills. On your back is the latest trend. I don't see what anyone can see in anyone else. People think people with disabilities have no value. You need to like tell your story and people can listen and say this is why benefits are extremely important. I don't see what anyone can see. I want to get married. I want to be able to live in the same house as my spouse. Here is the church and... They can stop us from getting married. They can stop us from living together. But they're never going to stop us from loving each other. This law needs to change. And we're going to do what we have to do to make this happen. Patrice is good at making dreams come true. Who wants to get married? Text reads, Patrice, the movie, ABC News Studios. There's something else you know there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, September 30th, stream on Hulu. Thank you. I am delighted to see you all here, and I cannot wait to watch Patrice, the movie. When I first came to Dredif, my predecessor, Arlene Marison, spoke to me about marriage penalties. She had advocated for Barbara Waxman and Daniel Figueroa to have a path to marry. Senior staff attorney Aisha Lewis joined Dredif and built Dredif's Marriage Equality Library. Aisha began working with Lori Long, who's with us online, a fabulous advocate who is engaged to the love of her life but cannot marry due to her medical support needs. These unfair rules deny countless disabled people the fundamental right to marry. Dredoff co-sponsored the wonderful marriage event in DC last year that's in the trailer and helped get federal legislation introduced. Shout out to Lori, Aisha, Carol Tyson, Dredoff's representative in DC, Tina Woods, and of course Patrice for all of your work on this vital issue. Marriage is only one of the myriad issues Dread of tackles for our constituents. We fight for children with disabilities who are denied their rights at school. Our clients include children with disabilities, disproportionately children of color who are disciplined and restrained instead of receiving disability supports. Children with disabilities who attend schools with such severe staffing shortages that they are left isolated at home for weeks. Children with disabilities who are denied what they need to acquire language and literacy. Shout out to Mohar Shah, Dredoff Fellow, Francesca Simon, and the entire Dredoff PTI staff. Jetta fights for parents with disabilities. Disabled parents are harshly scrutinized by courts and agencies and suffer the removal of their children at sky-high rates. We know that children can thrive when their disabled parents receive effective accommodations and supports. Staff attorney Kavya Parthaban represents disabled parents in dependency and appellate courts 
enforcing disability non-discrimination laws. She has trained hundreds of parent defenders and advocates for systemic changes. Access to affordable housing is another core dread of issue. Housing has always been a huge problem for us, but it's only gotten much, much worse. Led by DREDF Deputy Director Michelle Uzetta, DREDF fights disability discrimination in housing, including denials of reasonable accommodation, discrimination based on Section 8, and disability discrimination against unhoused people. Michelle represented the disability community in Grants Pass, the Supreme Court case that ruled that unhoused people who have nowhere to go are not protected by the U.S. Constitution. Following Grants Pass, Michelle and senior staff attorney Aaron Neff are partnering with advocates for unhoused people across the country to enforce disability rights laws. We also fight for access to health care. This includes accessible facilities, accessible equipment, and effective communication in websites, documents, and telehealth and appointments. Uh, we fight disability discrimination in health insurance plans. Our case against Cal HHS and Kaiser argues that California's Affordable uh, Care Act plan, which does not include coverage for wheelchairs, violates federal law. As a result of this discrimination, disabled people are forced to use old dangerous wheelchairs or stay at poverty wages to keep Medi-Cal. Boo, yeah. We recently won a ruling ordering Kaiser to pay for our client's wheelchair now and every five years. Shout out to Policy Director Sylvia Yee for leading this critical advo advocacy. The entire Dread of Policy team, including Sylvia, Carol, and Senior Policy Advisor Mary Lou Breslin, responds to the systemic issues of our time. Their work uncovers the impact of AI on people with disabilities. It sounds the alarm on how private equity is harming access to the supports disabled people need. Mary Lou is investigating how social housing may help increase permanent, affordable, accessible housing for disabled renters. Just yesterday, we published a piece on the impact that Project 2025 would have on our community. Spoiler, it's not, it's not good. Um, on every issue, from autonomous vehicles to the census to sidewalks, our message is simple. Stop leaving disabled people out of the conversation. When the pandemic hit this country, Dread of Staff spent nearly two years fighting to ensure that the pandemic response included people with disabilities and did not discriminate against us. We continue to fight for immunocompromised people who need masks and health care. We fight for remote access to public meetings. Uh, with some support from Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, Dredef recently succeeded in obtaining an Attorney General opinion that remote access to Brown Act meetings is a reasonable accommodation under federal law. We continue to respond to the impact of Dobbs on our community. Disabled people need access to a full range of accessible reproductive health care. Disabled people are at much higher risk for severe pregnancy complications and maternal death. Dreda fellow Jillian McLeod is training providers and advocates across the country on building accessible reproductive health care. She has successfully advocated with the state of California to include disability access information on its abortion portal. Dredef also knows that many transgender people are part of our community and are entitled to our advocacy. Dredef led the disability community brief in Scrimeti, the case at the U.S. Supreme Court that will decide whether states can ban gender-affirming care. We hope to welcome a law fellow next year to represent and advocate for trans-disabled youth. <laughs> Likewise, Given the groundswell of campus protests and related responses, we have circulated Know Your Rights materials for disabled protesters and a coalition statement condemning bans on face masks. Shout out to the team leading this work, including Michelle, Communications Director Tina Pinedo, and Paralegal Ali Klein. 
Um, as Nicole said, uh, last week we welcomed our first Judy Human Fellow, Felicia Asbury. Felicia will work on all DREADF issues affecting the most marginalized disabled people. And thank you again to our supporters, Kathy Pugh and Guy Wallace, for making that possible. I'd like to acknowledge Linda Kilb, who heads our Legal Services Trust Fund. Linda makes sure that DREADF continues to serve as a legal services support center, providing disability rights expertise to advocates across the state and country. And also resource associate Hong Yu Min, who manages hundreds of phone calls and emails from DREADF constituents. We could not do any of this work without you. Thank you. And please make sure you are registered to vote and have a voting plan. Hi everybody, how you doing? Awesome, all right. Now is the time in the program where I have the pleasure of introducing our Parent Training and Information Center team, our PTI staff. In a few minutes, uh, sec in a few seconds, you're gonna hear from Julie Barraza and family members Oza Omar and Alejandra Perez and Jason uh, Coronado. Thank you for being here. Just wanted to say that our parent training advocates do tireless work led by our longtime DREADF staff person and now PTI director, Cheryl Theus, and with help from Angela and Andrea and Julie, as you'll hear, really do amazing work helping and serving parents and so that they understand their rights as parents in community with children with disabilities. If you are a parent of a child with a disability, with a question, they have the answer. I guarantee it. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Julie. Everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm so excited to see all of you. Um, my name is Julia Barraza, and I am a senior education advocate here at DREADF. And despite the fact that we push, shove, and jackhammer, at DREADF, we are just as much a family as we are colleagues. Up on the screen are photos of me with some of my colleagues. Please wave or stand. Our PTI director, Cheryl Thies, <laughs> Andrea Yu, the new Mrs. Yu, Angela Haynes, and Diana Vega. Yay! <laughs> As you may know, DREDF is a Parent Training and Information Center, or PTI, funded by the U.S. Department of Education. We serve over 28 counties. Between the four of us, we field thousands of calls and attend trainings and support families. These free trainings and technical support are possible because of your donation. I was once one of those parents seeking this information. I found myself searching for advocacy support and stumbled on a dread of flyer by pure chance in my car in between two, um, two seats. That was 20 years ago. At that time, I needed help 
and I was also compelled to assist other families. During my time at Threadif, it was clear to me that there were monolingual Spanish-speaking families that need just as much, if not more, support than I ever did. Today, I see the same need, and with your support and with your donation, you can ensure that this work continues. On your table, there is a QR code, or if you would prefer, you can raise your hand and one of us can come by and pick up your uh, envelope. And um, I can't tell you how much this means to us as an agency, knowing that you are backing us up. Speaking of family, it's not unusual for us to enlist our family members to volunteer. Up on the screen are pictures of our kids, starting with my son, Matt, who's way back there right now, and Angela um, with her daughter, Tina. Hi, Tina. <laughs> and Cheryl Thies and her son, Liam. We spent a lot of time together. Like my colleagues, I've had the pleasure of meeting so many families and professionals, and along the way, I've picked up some really amazing friends. I want to take the time to say hello to Dr. Maya Gundelman, Dr. Grandison, Dr. Naomi, Isabel Bueso, who's here with her whole family, uh, Veronica Lau, my newest friend, um, Vanessa Colon, Sheridan Nicolau, hello, and uh, Karma Quick Padwala, I know she's back there. And of course, Omar, Alondra, and Jason, who you'll hear from shortly. At the PTI, we understand that when we assist parents or professionals, we're really supporting the whole family. At times, it is the sibling that is called to the role of advocate and the voice of a student. I had the opportunity to meet a truly exceptional young man, Omar Perez. He's here right now with his family and I happened to meet with him, meet him because he is a support person for my son. Omar got this job with EBI and one day came up to me and we spent a whole lot of time together and one day he happened to mention, you know, my brother has autism and I don't like the way the school is handling it with my mom. It's really bothering me. So we had a long conversation, I met his lovely mom and they took it from there. I'm excited for all of you to meet him and his lovely sister, Alondra. Um, and up on the screen, there's a picture of all of us, and we went to Great America last summer. <laughs> that was quite the day. Um, you will also meet a dad, Jason Conrado, and um, just such a standout when it comes to advocating for his son's rights. You're going to hear his passion for justice and holding people accountable. It will truly resonate with you. First, um, let's welcome Omar and his sister, Alondra. Good night. Hey. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Omar. And my name is Alondra Perez. It is an honor and pleasure to be here with you all tonight to share with you my journey of finding the necessary support for my brother, Gustavo. Gustavo is the youngest sibling. At the age of two, we began to notice some things about his development. Some of the things that we noticed about Gustavo was him not being verbal around our family and friends. He was disengaged from his peers and children his age, as well as difficulty concentrating on basic tasks. We decided it was in our family's and Gustavo's best interest to, do, to go to a doctor for further help. Upon further examination, a doctor diagnosed Gustavo with autism. Of course, we were familiar with the term, but what we didn't know was how this was gonna impact our family and what changes we had to make for Gustavo's well-being. And as his brother, I was unsure how to best help him, which made me feel scared of the uncertainty of his future. Imagine feeling lost and overwhelmed, unsure of how to advocate for your child's needs. This was the reality of my family situation. Over the years, 
we manage to teach him skills and help him become the most independent he can be. However, thinking back, we barely scratched the surface. Uh, the thing is that uh, with his family, uh, we didn't have a lot of outside help nor experience to best support our beloved family member. We took help from various resources such as YouTube, books, online forums, and advice from school staff and even um, friends. Due to the lack of knowledge and experience, we had to give faith to the school that he would get the best support through the development programs and look out for his best interests. But uh, unfortunately, during his around fourth grade year, I began to notice the flaws in his school system that were preventing him from succeeding. Some of the things I noticed that the staff were just um, putting all of these children in a uh, classroom away from everyone else and just putting tablets in front of their faces. And they were just like that for eight hours straight all at a time. Um, it was very hard to see that, just seeing the kids just very disengaged with others. And then also neglectful staff were just too busy, always on their phone in the corner and the kids just not having any support or not even doing any type of activities. And, and even if they did, it was just irrelevant. And it was just a step back for all these students um, learning. In regards to, to Gustavo, uh, one of Gustavo's peers at the time, I remember a classmate of his always left the classroom and the staff were so caught up on their phones that they didn't even notice he was gone till a parent brought up um, to, his, to their attention. These issues just barely scratched the surface on how neglectful the environment that Gustavo was in and soon discovered how broken the school system that our part, brother was a part of. It was a moment that I realized that we could no longer trust the school that Gustavo was a part of and began to desperately look outside of resources to help him with his development growth. We were so worried with the little progress he was making at school that our mother decided to take off, take some time off of work to figure out how to, to best support Gustavo. Our mother searched endlessly to find any resources in our local area to help Gustavo. But in the end of our search, but in the end, our search came new. As a family, we felt like we hit a brick wall in our journey of helping Gustavo. So as me being the oldest sibling and a bilingual speaker, I felt that I needed to step up and see if I could find any, res any resources to help my younger brother. To be honest, my lack of experience and knowledge led me desperately looking for any resources that I could find around me. After countless years of looking for an institution to help my brother, I felt that I was at a crossroads that we would ever find help for Gustavo. I began to give up that such a place could exist to help with my family's unique situation. Until one day, I came across a job posting from a company named East Bay Innovations, where I began working as a community day support specialist for adults with developmental disabilities. One of my very first clients was Julie's son, Benjamin, who I quickly began to foster a bond with their family. Upon strengthening our bond, I learned that Julie is an advocate for a nonprofit called Dredif. The timing seemed almost too good to be true, almost like it was fate. And with her gracious support, she began to take my family under her wing. With Julie and Dredif's support, everything has begun to change. Julie and Dredif provided essential technical information on basic rights, helping my mother understand how to secure an individualized education program, or IEP, uh, in our native language. This wasn't just about paperwork, it was about ensuring my brother received the tailored support he deserved. Furthermore, Julie explained the timelines involved in the IEP process and emphasized my mom's right to seek an outside evaluation. This was a game changer. With Julie and Dred's help, our family learned that we can get a clear understanding of my brother's education needs through private assessments. Our family pursued multiple private evaluations, which ultimately brought together a team of professionals to craft an IEP that truly reflected who my brother is and what he requires to thrive in school. This wasn't just a bureaucratic process. It was about understanding my brother's unique strengths and challenges. The, I the IEP became a roadmap for his success, ensuring that he would receive the support tailored to him. Now, Thanks to these efforts, my brother is in an environment where he is not only comfortable, but is also receiving the appropriate services without the stress of hearings or complaints. This is an incredible relief for our family. 
my sister Alondra pointed out a crucial aspect. My mother can now leave for work without worrying about my brother's educational needs being neglected. This peace of mind is just invaluable. Working with Julie and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund has profoundly impacted my life. Not a day goes by that I don't feel thankful for crossing paths with them. Dredev's unwavering support has shown me that I am not alone in this journey. Through their guidance, my family has grown closer, and I have even found the inspiration to pursue my dreams. Because of the resources and encouragement I've received from Julie and Dredev, I am inspired to obtain my master's in social work so that I can pay forward the knowledge I received from Dredev. Thank you. I will do everything in my ability to ensure that no child gets left behind. So in closing, I want to emphasize that every children deserves an education that meets their unique needs. With the right support, families can navigate the complexities of the system and advocate for their children with confidence. So I would like to thank Dredif, I would like to thank Julie, and thank you all for listening to our story. Oops. Together we can make a difference in the lives of children who need it most. So next, I'd like to welcome to the stage Jason, the father of another student like my brother, who is now getting what he needs at school because of the PTI. Thank you, everybody. Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Conrado. Thank you, Omar. Um, I'd like to say, uh, you know, thank you to Juliet for, for having me and my family out here. I'm here with my family, my fiance, Nikki, my son, Jaden, and my daughter, Brielle. Uh, our journey is fairly unique. Um, we come out from a small town in Angels Camp. Uh, it's about 120 miles east of here. Um, it's a, it's a very small community, um, very um, limited on resources. So it was determined that my son had a you know, behavioral disability and that he needed some support. Um, however, receiving that support from the school was another story. Um, instead of accommodations, he received discrimination things such as uh, being kicked off the basketball team or being you know, wrongfully punished for things that sometimes he didn't even do. <clears throat> this, is, this went on, has gone on for years. Um, and you, know, you could imagine the frustration, um, you know, having your child experiencing um, you know, these negative um, um, consequences for something that was out of his control. Um, it wasn't until actually c connecting with Juliet that things actually started um, turning around for me and my family. Um, I was, uh, you know, made aware of many of, of the rights that weren't being applied. Um, Jaden received, um, you know, in a, another evaluation from the school. He's actually in the process of receiving his um, uh, IEE. Um, and since then, he's graduated from, from uh, the district um, and now is receiving, um, receiving support that he's been needing. Um, it's, it's because Juliet was willing to, um, you know, uh, participate in these Zoom meetings with the, with the district that actually got the attention of the district and uh, things actually started changing for the positive. Um, so things are looking up from here for sure. They're they're definitely improving. It's um, it's been years of basically fighting for for what you know just equality. Um, and so let's see. He started high school within the last two months, and the the high school has been actually very. Very good. We had uh, multiple meetings before, and they have so much support. It's been a complete 180 for Jaden. He's actually uh, he's getting straight A's at this point. He's everything has turned around for him. Yeah. So <clears throat> I just wanted to say uh, thank you for Dredif and Juliet 
It's been nothing short of, a, of an amazing experience. And all you people that, that do this work, it's, uh, you know, I thank you guys so much. Um, without you, you know, it's, it would be, you know, we'd still be battling. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to our families. Those are the real stories. Thank you so much for sharing them. And thank you again to everyone who works together to make such good things happen. So now is the time of the program where I'm going to make a, another quick donation pitch. Uh, and so here are the ways that if you haven't already, you can contribute to Greteth. There is or will be very shortly a QR code. Look at that. A QR code on the screen. There's a center tent card, tent card on your table. A link will be dropped in the Zoom, Zoom chat for all of our virtual attendees. Thank you for being here. You can also go to our website, www.dreadf.org slash donate. And there are even envelopes at the registration table if you still have a checkbook, I, have, I still have a checkbook. If you prefer to write a check, please put one in the donation envelope. Thanks very much. Okay. And now I'm going to transition to the time in our program where we remember those that we have lost since the last time we came together in community like this. As we all know, COVID was devastating to our community. And there are many people who we have lost and there are too many to name. There's a partial list on our program. If you'd like to go to our GALA program website, if you'd like to add names, please let us know. I want to uplift several people who are who are and will always be in our hearts specifically at dreadf marilyn golden our policy advocate who worked tirelessly on transportation and so many other things our beloved judy human i think about judy every day when i come to the ed roberts campus her picture is right over there next to the ramp. Our board member, Taylor Hegler, our social media coordinator, and our board member, Talana, uh, uh, Talana Jones. And so again, as I said, so many others. So if you could please join me in a moment of silence so that we can remember those that we love and lost in our community. Thank you, everybody. Okay, this is the tricky part about being the MC. Now I'm switching again. We are, now we're gonna give out uh, some awards. Uh, three awards that I'm gonna tell you about and then there'll be a short video company. So our first award is the Susan Henderson Media Access Award, which we are awarding to Verizon Communications. The Susan Henderson Media Access Award, named after our very own Susan Henderson, uh, honors Verizon Communications for its exceptional commitment to media accessibility and inclusion. 
this award, named in tribute to Susan, as I said, for her efforts in an, is awarded for her efforts in representation of people with disabilities in the media, also recognizes Verizon's significant contributions to ensuring that the disability collection continues. By championing, championing inclusive practices through strong partnerships and elevating the collection itself through meaning, meaningful dialogue, Verizon Communications exemplifies the spirit of this award and supports a more equitable media environment for all. And now we're going to show a brief video from Zachary Michael Bastian, Senior Manager of Strategic Alliances for Verizon. Good evening. My name is Zachary Bastian, and on behalf of Verizon Communications, I am so thrilled to accept the Susan Henderson Media Access Award. As a quick visual description, I am a white man with brown curly hair, wearing gold-rimmed glasses, and a blue long sleeve shirt. Thank you to the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, to Tina for your friendship and partnership, to our wonderful collaborators at Getty Images, and to all the photographers that create these beautiful photos. From the day that I started working on this project in 2018, with Margot Joffe, who really got the ball rolling on the disability collection, I've had so much fun. So my wish for all of you is that you find projects like this that get you inspired. Accessibility is a team sport. Representation is a team sport. We need everyone on the team and everybody has a role to play. So get out there, build a big tent, invite people to collaborate and see what happens. In 2025, we have really exciting things in store for the Disability Collection. We're excited to share those with you, but for tonight, enjoy this beautiful evening and thank you. Our second award, our Disability Excellence Award, goes to Getty Images. The Disability Excellence Award recognizes Getty Images for its outstanding dedication to disability inclusion and representation in media. The award ce celebrates the efforts of Getty Images to enhance the visibility and portrayal of individuals with disabilities through diverse and inclusive energy, uh, imagery. You need to be able to be seen. By prioritizing feedback directly from disabled leaders, and ensuring that disability representation is both accurate and authentic. The Disability Collection by Getty Images sets a high standard for the industry and fosters a more inclusive media landscape. Dredif is proud to honor Getty Images for their leadership and commitment to disability excellence. And now a video from Dr. Rebecca Swift, Head of Creative at Getty Images. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Rebecca Swift. I'm the Head of Creative at Getty Images. I'm truly honoured to accept the Disability Excellence Award from DREDF on behalf of Getty Images. Thank you so much for this recognition. I'm really sorry I can't be with you today, but I'm currently stuck in London. Um, this award is incredibly meaningful to us because it represents our ongoing commitment to accurate, authentic and diverse representation of the disability community. At Getty Images, we believe that imagery has the power to change perceptions, drive social change and move the world. We also know that what we choose to show and how we show it has a profound impact on how people and communities are both perceived and understood. Our journey in disability inclusion has been deeply enriched by our collaboration with organisations like the NDLA, DREDEF, Verizon and the incredible leaders throughout the community who have guided us on our journey. Your feedback, insights and advocacy have been invaluable in helping us create the Disability Collection, a collection that truly reflects the diverse and multidimensional experiences of the disability community. It's through these partnerships that we have been able to make meaningful progress and for that we are deeply grateful. Receiving this award is not just a moment of celebration for us and believe me we will celebrate, um, it is a call to continue the work. We understand that there is still so much to be done and we are committed to continuously pushing the boundaries to ensure that disability representation is not only inclusive but also empowering. 
We want to set a standard for the industry that moves beyond tokenism to genuine representation that celebrates disability as part of the human experience and the diversity within the, the, the experience. Thank you again to DREDA for this incredible honour. We are proud to stand alongside you in this journey and uh, we look forward to continuing to work together to drive change through the power of imagery. Thank you again. And our third and final award for the evening is the Disability Law Co-Counsel Award presented to Justin Armand with A&O Sherman. The Disability Law Co-Counsel Award recognizes exceptional collaboration between legal professionals and disability advocacy organizations celebrating those who significantly impact the rights and representation of people with disabilities. This award honors attorneys who, through their dedication and expertise, have made substantial contributions to advancing disability rights in the legal arena. For the past two years, Justin Armand of a and Sherman has partnered with Dredef, drafting and filing friend of the court briefs on behalf of the disability community. He has filed briefs in major cases affecting disabled people in the U.S. Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals. Throughout his many projects with Dredef, Justin has been thoughtful, stalwart, stalwart, patient, and brilliant. We are delighted to have the opportunity to recognize Justin's substantial contribution to Dredef's work. Justin's parents are about to visit him from out of state so he couldn't make it here in person and he wishes he could have joined us here tonight. But for now, here's a video from Justin. Hi everyone, I hope you're all having a wonderful night and I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there with you in person to celebrate. Um, I'm truly, truly humbled and honored to receive this recognition from Drev. Uh, in a testament to time flying and preparing these short remarks, I spent some time looking back over my work with this wonderful organization over the years. Um, and I see that it stretches back from more than three years when we first worked together on an amicus brief to the Supreme Court in CBS versus Doe, which was a case that challenged the meaningful access standard under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Uh, Dredef's dedication to its mission and collaborative spirit struck me from the start. Um, watching this organization and its partners pull every possible lever to protect the rights of people with disabilities, um, which culminated in CBS dropping its appeal to the Supreme Court, which never happened. Um, I was in awe, and, and I have been ever since. I've, I've now lost count of the number of appellate briefs we've done in, in these important cases together, um, working to make sure that courts passing judgment on important appeals, um, including recently issues of reproductive justice, uh, have a record in front of them of how their de decisions will affect the lives of people with disabilities. Um, it has been a true privilege to join with you all in these fights um, and to work alongside and learn from the brilliant advocates at Dredef. So thank you all again, and a special thanks to Claudia and Michelle uh, for putting your trust in me over these last several years. Uh, enjoy the rest of the night, have fun, celebrate, and donate. Uh, thank you all, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. We have done it. We have reached the end of our program, everybody. Uh, just a few more things to say in closing. Please, please, make sure you're registered to vote. If you are registered to vote and you know someone who isn't registered to vote, please help them vote. This particular election cycle is so important, please. I want to say thank you to all of our guests. Thank you all for being here. It's truly wonderful to have everyone together virtually and here in person. I want to say thank you to our interpreters, Juan Ramirez, Stephanie Chow, Jewel Warguini, our cart provider, Lisa Johnston, and to all of you, our generous sponsors, to our Leftwoods event specialists, Everything AV, 
and Hugh Groman Catering for this amazing food thing and making everything possible. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, this we need to take a moment to uh, thank our event producers, our development director, Susan Freundlich. Where are you, Susan? And Tina Pinedo, who really made all of the all of the details work. Thank you, Tina. And to the staff gala committee, if you're still around, could you wave or stand up if you're able? Thank you so much. And to everyone at DREDF, all of the staff, please. Uh, stand up if you're able, and, and we just want to acknowledge all of you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, I want to uh, encourage you. Please uh, mingle, enjoy each other. Thank you for being here today. It's really a pleasure. Let's continue the fight together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>